Welcome to The Apartment Guys, where we dive deep into all things multifamily investing. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and empower real estate investors to reach their highest potential. Each week, host Tate Seamer interviews high-level guests from all over the industry who are sure to bring valuable, actionable ideas that will propel your career to the next level. Whether you're just starting out or a seasoned investor, you are in the right place. And now your host, the apartment guy, Tate Seamer. All right, everybody. We are back with the apartment guys and gals today. I love when the ladies come on the show. It's one of my favorite things. And today I've got my friend, Angel Williams, with me and angel is getting her very first deal like big scale multifamily apartment deal done right now which is so exciting we're gonna jump into that and talk about all the things going into that but uh first of all angel say hi to everybody i'm so glad to have you on board hi everybody <laughs> <laughs> absolutely that's how we roll so angel you and i met at the michael blanc dealmaker live event in 2019 yep. pre-covid and and uh we've stayed in touch via various networking groups and meetup groups and i've watched you at and as you've grown and you're particularly in your mindset i think and and kind of uh, as as you've immersed yourself in the networking and and, and the learning uh, these events and whatnot um, but i i really want to kind of hear it from your perspective as far as your story and real estate and kind of how you got to pulling off your first big deal here. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so my husband and I both grew up in families that invested in real estate. Um, so us moving into real estate investing wasn't out of the norm. It, it was something like when we bought our first house, like we didn't even discuss it. We knew that would be our first rental. Yeah. Okay. Um, like we just knew. Um, so we got that first house in 03 and transitioned it to our first rental in 07. And then I want to say in 10, we got another house and then another one. And then we got a couple more in a portfolio <laughs> about a year ago. And so um, I say all that just to say that single family homes, I think, are my comfort zone mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I understand them. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the numbers are smaller. They're more palatable <laughs> and you can do it alone. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. You can solopreneur it. If you absolutely. Will. And so, you know, as we've. We, we saw the scalability in the commercial multifamily realm. And we were like, we need that. We want that. Um, having a special needs child, we need to be able to cover his medical expenses mm. and single family homes are, it's just a slow roll. And yeah, um, it, is. it would have taken us exponentially longer to get yeah. where we need to get financially to be able to cover his needs and, and still cover the needs of his typical sisters. So, yeah, yeah. Well, so that's a, a, a fantastic big why right there, your, your, your children and, uh, and your one child in particular. And, uh, you know, that's something you can really put your heart into and, and something that's going to inspire you along the way. So talk a little bit about, see, so what was it? Oh, three, you said you bought your first house. We were talking a little bit before the show mm -hmm. and, uh, and then in Oh six, it became a rental roughly. Yeah. Oh, six, oh, seven. Okay, cool. And in 06, 07, did anything change for you in terms of your thinking about real estate or mindset, or were you kind of already on this trajectory and, uh, and just kind of stepping into it? So I think like, I think when you're on the residential side, it's not as big of a mindset shift. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And especially if you've, if you've been exposed to it a lot, then it doesn't seem so abnormal. Yeah. Um, when it came to us moving into like commercial multifamily, it was like, this is way different. <laughs> and some people are like, oh, just add a zero. It's not just adding a zero. Um, it's, it's a completely different thought process Yeah. because it's no longer just, okay, is the rent going to cover my mortgage with a little bit of cash left over? Mm -hmm. um, it's no longer that because you're not just buying you're not just buying the housing, you're buying the business of the housing. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so it probably wasn't until about maybe 
three years ago, maybe four, probably three. Um, I can't tell you the exact moment my mindset shifted. Mm. I just remember the day I realized it had. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. the reason I say that is because a friend of mine, me, me and my friend were taking our daughters to a throws camp because they're throwers, shot putters, discuses, you know. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, cool. And so we were going to this camp. Well, my friend's like, it says it's sold out. And I was like, well, let's go anyway, because it's a lot harder to say no to someone's face. And so we went anyway. She's like, I don't want to spend the money to go. It's two hours away. And I was like, look, we'll take my car. I'll pay for the gas. Worst case scenario, if it's, if they're truly all booked up, we'll just go shopping. Yeah. Have a nice drive. Right. Um, but we got there and it turned out that his sales pays on his funnel was down. And so we were able to get into the event. Hmm. Um, but I, I just kept saying, you know, this isn't, this isn't a shutdown thing. So it says no on it. We're still going to go and ask Mm -hmm. because it's harder to say no to your face. And then I was also like, you know, and worst case scenario, we can't get in. We just find out who this guy is and have him come do a camp in our hometown. And that was the day I realized that I no longer thought on a small scale. Mm -hmm. I thought larger scale. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, it's not perfect by any means of the spectrum, Mm -hmm. but I, I have that tendency now to think in bigger terms than I used to. Clearly. And, and your results show that, right. And really, I mean, we talk so much about, we, I just had Dr. Hank sites on two episodes, three episodes ago and talked up at length about how thoughts become things mm-hmm. and how, and I talk about how the most important real estate to develop is the real estate between your ears. Like you've got to have that level of mindset that believes you can do something before you can do it. It just, that's just the way it works. It's, it's the universe just kind of works that way. It seems. And once, and, and the great thing is, and the, the really wonderful news is that what I found is that once you really truly believe in your heart that you can do something that it really is, does become possible and things show up in ways that they didn't before. And, and uh, resources show up, ideas, people, um, you know, money, all the things necessary deals. Like I might've said that already, but like all the, all the necessary <laughs> uh, things to be successful start to line up. And, and that doesn't mean you don't go out and work hard. And, and it takes, like you said, Angel, it's not a matter of just adding a zero. And <clears throat> it's tempting sometimes to talk about Oh, par- apartments are easier than single family. And, and, you know, it's just, a, it's just a matter of adding a zero and it, it, that sort of thing. And uh, I'm here to tell you, like, it's, it's a lot, a lot, lot, lot of work. And especially your first deal is like, I, I have the image in my head of, I th- um, is it Sisyphus that's pushing the the rock up the hill in the in the ancient Greek? Thing? Anyway, um, I think it was Sisyphus. Anyway, like some you know, that first rock that you're or the first big deal is like it feels a lot like moving a big boulder uphill, and it keeps and, falling on you every now and then. Yeah, right. And <laughs> and 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 not knowing where the top is sometimes, like it feeling endless, like yet you have a deadline that you have to, mm-hmm. that you have to make, or you're going to lose the deal and lose earnest money. And it's like game on and yeah. it's stressful. And, you know, you have to learn how to do a lot of things that you didn't know that you didn't know. Yeah. And that's what you, I, I, I know that's what's happening with you guys right now. Um, you just, so, so tell us a little bit about this deal. It's, it's a 72 unit. It's your first GP active side deal where you're the operators, the syndicators, and uh, where is it? And, and tell us all that stuff. It is 14 minutes from my front door. Okay. Wow. So it is right here, which is super nice. Yep. In um, Texas. It is. I, I'm in North Texas. So North it's, Texas. it's in a pretty good place. Um, you know, it's, it's got similar returns to what you're seeing in other deals right now. Um, mm-hmm. But the best part for me is that it's just so dang close to my house. I mean, if something hits the fan, <laughs> yeah. I can be there Yeah, yeah. and deal with it directly and take care of the issue. Yeah. So, there's, there's so much to be said for that. There really is. Uh, is it a value add? 
So there's some value add pieces to it. Um, we're going to do some exterior. We're probably going to do some covered parking. Um, we want to do some upgrades to the playground areas and the dog parks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and honestly though it's pretty darn nice <laughs> okay so um mostly exterior and then a few upgrades as we near the end so we come to the we come to our five years or wherever it's going to be whether it's a three four five seven um okay. we'll hang on to a few of the classics and mm -hmm. do the renos on them close to when we think we're going to be at the turn and then those will become the premiums mm -hmm. and there'll be a whole slew of units ready to get upgraded. And so there'll be a whole lot of meat on the bone. Okay. So right now, is it a hundred percent classic? No. Um, okay. so I think there's 10 or 15 classic units out of the seven. Oh, okay. Them. And the, what are the other 72 or what are the other, other than those 12? Um, so those are going to be more in the premium and the upgraded. Okay. Okay, cool. Basically you don't have a heavy lift as far as physical capital improvements in terms of interiors at all. sounds like um, it's more of a kind of a, more of a management play, right? Like yeah. there's, you have below average rents kind of thing. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit complicated when it comes to that because it's all bills paid. Yeah. And a lot of the comps are not all bills paid. Okay. So how do you do a good comparison with that? Right. Yeah. Um, but in the in our webinar, we did talk about how we are in a good place as far as being able to push rents because the rents currently are not at third of the income. Okay. So there's a little bit of room there for some upward push on rents. And we're also going to bring in some water conservation and we're going to do, we're going to try and implement some rubs and just see yeah. where it goes. Yeah. It seems like you should be able to offboard some of that uh, all inclusiveness of the utilities and the rent payment and get them at least paying electric, maybe a water something. bill back, some, some sort of, yeah, something. Because it, right? it appears that this demographic is willing to pay a premium for only having to make one payment. Mm -hmm. So they, mm -hmm. they lack the all bills paid feature. I see. Kind of just summarize the overall business plan and like plan of attack. Like what, what, you, how are you guys going to hit it up? So the first thing I think we want to do is really take a look at the covered parking um, because we are in Tornado Alley. <laughs> yeah. And so we get a lot of hailstorms here. Okay. Yeah. So, I, or at least that's the first thing I want to look at um, is offering people protect, protection for their vehicles because mm -hmm. a lot of times people that are going to be in your apartments, their biggest investment is their car. That's right. Yep. And so let's offer them some protection for that vehicle during the, during the stormy season. Mm -hmm. And that's probably going to be hitting about say March, April. So that should give us enough time to get closed before the end of the year and get some of those things taken care of. There's, there's some other things we want to do as far as landscaping and trees and, mm -hmm. and get those things taken care of too. We'd mm -hmm. really like for it to look beautiful yeah. and that can be done here. Um, it just, we need to get it. We need to get it looking pretty. So makes such a huge difference. Are you going to change name? Are you going to do any signage, anything like that? So it's all really pretty nice. Is it? Um, yeah. We cool. like it. And the lending office is really nice. It's got a clubhouse and it's when we were there for due cool. diligence, that like became our office. <laughs> nice. So we were all there during that time period, um, yeah. making sure that everything was getting arranged and getting all the scheduling going. And then if something, if someone was a no show or whatever, could we move another meeting up into that spot? So it was, a lot of scheduling that was taking place amongst us. And it was really nice to have the whole team there. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, tell me, tell me a little bit about your team. Like as you've, you know, for somebody thinking about doing this for the first time, like you're doing, you obviously, this is not a team or this is not a solopreneur venture. No, <laughs> uh, this is very much a team sport. And so I, I'm assuming I, you and I haven't talked about this, but I'm assuming that you have some partners on on this deal or a partner or something like that? We, we absolutely do. Mm -hmm. um, so there are five of us. If you count Jason and I as one. Um, so we have Jennifer Joyce and she's mm -hmm. our experience piece. Cause she's got a ton of deals down. Um, and she's just been doing this for a really long time. Mm -hmm. um, so she's our experience piece. And then there's Carrie love and Bruce strong and K Trevor Thompson and me and Jason. Yeah. I know Trevor. That's awesome. Congrats. That's super fun. And so, you know, like 
obviously I'm in a deal with it where there's five partners uh, in two, I'm in two deals where there's five partners and they were two of our first large scale deals. And one was 179 units. The other was 70 units. And it took all five of us to get that deal done. And every single partner was extreme and is extremely valuable in, in those deals. Uh, and sometimes it takes that many people. Ideally, right? You, you're not necessarily splitting up ownership, you know, 10 ways or eight ways or, or something like that. But if it takes five partners, six partners, four partners to get the deal done and look, you need the resume, like you said, and the experience, you need the net worth and liquidity and, and, uh, you need the, uh, somebody with the funds to fund earnest money and due diligence costs. Like these are all key components of your team. You need somebody that's just great with underwriting and, uh, and somebody else that's great with due diligence and, and you need, that takes multiple people often and more, more often, I mean, really almost always it takes multiple people. And, and so Absolutely. we, what our approach is to do this on a deal by deal basis, right? Like it's always Carl and myself and, uh, and now Chelsea, um, a lot of, a lot of our listeners know my two partners, but you, you know, beyond that, it's, we, we really structure things uh, kind of on a deal by deal basis. And I'm sure you're kind of looking at this the same way. Like let's do, let's get this one done. Let's we're not, we're not hitting a grand slam here. You're not going to get, you know, you're not sending kids through college on this one deal alone, but heck it's a 72 unit apartment deal. And that's, that's, that's real. Like that's legit. And Michael Blanc talks about the law of the first deal and that's getting the first deal done, you know, and that's exciting. Well, and it's, um, this has been, this is a really awesome team. Like when I think about how it got put together, like how we all met one another and knew one another. Um, and then seeing us all in action, whereas when things go sideways, I tend to freak. Mm -hmm. I'm going to freak out. I'm going to yell. I'm going to scream. And it may take me a little while to calm down. Well, on our team, everybody is so like just solutions driven mm -hmm. that I don't even freak out because I know that there are other people in the meeting that are already thinking of solutions. So yeah. I don't have to freak out. Yeah. Your team gives you that confidence, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, we've got a C-suite <laughs> that comes in and he goes, okay, this is our agenda for the meeting. What are our action steps? Let's summarize. And so we've got that person that knows how to get projects done. What did and you then, call them? A C-suite? What's that mean? A C like a CEO, COO. Okay. So just he, he wears multiple, kind of wears multiple hats. Yeah. And just yeah, that, that knows how to, how to see the project and get it to its completion. Yep. Got it. And then we have another guy that he must absolutely love all the details because for like the PPM and for other DOS, he's been like on page, blah, 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 in, par in paragraph, da, da, da. It says this, shouldn't it say this? And mm -hmm. I've compared this to previous, um, you know, documents that I've seen in other deals that I'm passive in and in comparing them, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. just like, holy night, because I would never want to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And, and look, you got to have kind of a special skill and talent set for skill set for that sort of thing. And, uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes like, I feel like I'm almost just good enough at some stuff like that to be dangerous. Um, but like underwriting, it, there's, you, you have to nail that stuff. Like you, you can't get it wrong. It's it, you, that's why I have Jason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and you got to have that on your team. You got to have somebody on the team. That's like, you know, that, that nothing's going to slip by. And luckily, uh, you know, Chelsea and myself on my team, we, we handle all of our underwriting at, at the high level stuff. And between the two of us, I think we're, we're really pretty good. Um, I wouldn't want to, I want to, wouldn't want it to just be me though. Um, it, it's, it's such an important part of what this stage of what you're doing. And then now let's talk about capital raising. So you guys just did your webinar last mm -hmm. week. And uh, how did that go? Tell me all about that. Um, wow. I mean, like when, when it transitioned from me to Trevor, 
I mean, it was like a bad B movie. It's like, hey, Trevor, <laughs> you want to tell us about the property? And as soon as it came out of my mouth, I was like, what the heck am I thinking? Yeah, <laughs> what everybody, just came out of my mouth? <laughs> but nobody noticed that. I, I guarantee you nobody noticed that. <laughs> but it just, I mean, when you're in the middle of it and you're doing it, you don't think about yeah. it. You're yeah. just going. It's just boom, boom, boom. You just go. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, it's quite an experience to put up. We just did a live webinar for 37 people and uh, two days of yesterday and 80, 90% of it was me and presenting it and uh, our, our latest opportunity. And it's an intense experience and it's kind of like uh, game on, right? Like, you know, you, the, in our case in, and in your case too, it sounds like you've got this really exciting opportunity that you kind of can't wait to tell people about and you got to come at you really got to come at it from that perspective and that that with that energy like like this is the coolest thing and you know can't wait to get you and everybody that I know else I know on board because it's so exciting and uh, and that's the way syndication is and you can get in these deals for so much less than most people think um, really, I mean, there's syndicators that will work with you at 25, $30,000 of investment capital. And, and Absolutely. I mean, most want 50, um, is a minimum investment, but at the same time, like I know my team will, somebody wants to do 30, 25, 30, 40, like, heck let's do it. Like, it's great for us and it's good for them. And we, there's no reason not to. So but how much capital you guys raising for this one? That's a 2.9 million. Okay, cool. That's, that's healthy. Yep. That's, that's one that's, way to put it. <laughs> that's yeah. That's, that's, that's $2,900,000 investors. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I, I know and we, we did that in March twice. Like I get it. It's difficult enough to the point that we brought in on our most recent, one of our most recent deals, uh, preferred equity source. Um, which we thought would make things easier. And um, let me tell you how ironic that is um, that we would uh, think that working with preferred equity source would be an easy thing because um, it has not been. Um, but uh, nonetheless, there are advantages to that um, and they can enable you to get deals done that you otherwise wouldn't be able to get done. And at the end of the day, like, the priority is if you got a deal under contract and you got even not even refundable earnest money, like soft earnest money, you need to get that deal done. Like mm -hmm. that the brokers are watching you, the lenders are watching you, your investors are watching you, the market's watching you. And if you get it done, the rewards will be huge, huge, huge. Like, and, and that's what Michael Blanc, Blanc talks about with that law of the first deal thing is, once you get that first deal done, it's no longer like pushing boulders up a mountain. It is more like kind of gently nudging boulders down the mountain in directions that you want it to go and still working hard, right? You're still like, you know, on top of your everything, your operations, your acquisitions, your capital raising, the, the whole, all of the aspects of your business, but deals show up a lot easier because people now know that you close deals and they know you as an entity that can get things done. Capital shows up because your investors are now excited about what you're doing and what, um, how they're going to do with you. Right. Like yeah. this is all real stuff. So like, I'm so excited for you because this is like, you'll always look back at this deal and at, you know, 2021 as, when you, when you're telling your story on a podcast in three, four five years, you'll look back, you'll be talking about this deal a lot. I and I will you. never forget this because this has been probably the most exhausting, but exciting thing at the same time that I have yeah. ever done to date. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's wild. It's like, there's super, super highs. There are super, super lows and there's not a whole lot of in between. <laughs> so. Yeah. And, you know, the, along with like all the mindset techniques that we talk about and all the stuff that you got to like do and uh, not gotta, but like the things that are powerful to do. And when you're developing yourself, like one of those things is 
as when you get into these higher level deals, you've got to be able to kind of compartmentalize and put these deals in a box. And when you need to put them aside, put the lid on the box and not think about them for 10 hours or whatever, it, whatever it takes you to go get a good night's sleep and put your phone somehow, in the box. <laughs> yeah. Somehow I, yeah, <laughs> somehow I've been able to do that and I don't know how, but I, I'm able to just completely forget about stuff when I'm not working on it. Um, but it, I, I, I really like my partner isn't, it doesn't really have that as much as I do. And I feel for him because it, 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 this stuff will eat you alive if, if you let it. And, uh, you know, for me, like the Hal Elrod thing, the, the miracle equation, um, which is unwavering faith plus extraordinary effort equals miracles. Like that's what it's all about for me. Like that unwavering faith, the vision that things somehow are going to work out. This deal somehow going to close. This money's coming from somewhere. This next deal is coming from somewhere. I don't know where yet, but it's going to happen. Like that has been of all things that for me and, and, you know, that has been like the, as much the kind of the key or the, the secret code. Um, and then you just like work really, really hard and as smart as you can. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think, probably some of the best advice that we've gotten um, was a, a few weeks back with coach T and he's like, you know, you've got to, how do you say it? You've got to discipline your disappointment. Mm, yeah. So like, mm. I'm, I'm talking about like riding these highs and riding these lows. Well, yeah. eventually you get to a place where you're riding down the middle because mm. you've disciplined, not only the disappointments, but you've disciplined those super highs too. Yeah. yeah. And so everything is more manageable in a better range. Because I think part yeah. of what is so exhausting in this first deal is that when good things happen, I am through the roof. Yeah. When not good things happen, I'm like, I want to crawl into a hole and just live there yeah. for a couple of days. Yeah, <laughs> I, I get it. I get it. And because it's the first time you've done it. So it feels so much bigger and so much heavier than it will three, four five deals from now. Right. Um, and I know that because we're on our, I think, sixth or seventh at this point. Uh, as far as these l larger scale um, asset class uh, deals. And, but at the same time, honestly, we're, our learning curve is still pretty steep and there is still a lot of, you don't know what you don't know in this business. And, and it's like anything worth doing really in life is, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, learning violin or, or skiing or whatever, like, until you really get in there and do it and try, try it and try hard at it and like set your mind, like I'm going to get this deal done at all costs. Like you don't know what you don't know about the process and the steps you got to take and the, the mindset you got to have and relationships you got to develop and all that stuff, you know, the, the legal stuff, the, the broker stuff, the property manager stuff, the investor, it, it just, it's kind of endless. And in a way, and in, a, in another way, it's like you, you just put a great team together and start building systems and processes and start putting one foot in front of the other and good things seem to happen. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. And I think part of that is just like realizing that the universe wants to see you succeed. Yeah. And so whatever, it's kind of like just regular old inertia, like you're moving forward. The universe is going to help you move forward. I love that. I love that. I love that. I really do. That kind of like uh, almost makes me a little emotional, to be honest. Like, I just, I love the idea that the universe helps us move forward, but, but it's kind of, to me, it's like those electric assist bikes where you got to start pedaling first a little bit and then the power kicks in or the scooters. Like if you get on those rental scooters on the side of the streets, like you gotta, you gotta get the scooter going with your own strength first before that electric motor kicks in. And that to me is kind of like how it works in the universe with you, like, you got to show up, you got to sweat and do the things. And the, and then the universe shows up too. it really, and not to get spiritual and woo woo on this podcast. Cause I've only done it, a, <laughs> you know, a few hundred other times, but, um, <laughs> uh, I, I really believe that stuff. I really, really do. And I, I I've seen it and, um, 
in my life and, and continue to, you know, I continue to see it. And, and, you know, the great thing is you become more and more kind of like conscious, I guess, or, uh, you know, aware of some of this stuff is you, is you start to see amongst other things, you start to see ways that you used to shoot yourself in the foot. You know what I'm talking about? And, uh-huh. and, uh, and, 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 and you start to like, get real with yourself about that. And like, you know, like, Hey, this isn't serving me. Like, why am I doing this? And, and cut it out. Like, you know, let's, let's move on and, and, and not do this anymore kind of thing and not say these things. Like that's to me is one of the biggest ones is the, the way that we talk to ourselves and the kind of the inner space that we live in, right. The inner environment that we live in is how is our, how's our house? Is it clean? Is it, is it fresh? Does it smell good? Is it organized? Or, you know, could it, could it use a little bit of work? Right. And I think all of us could use a little bit of work pretty much all the time, but, um, the more work, I, I, I love this phrase, the better it gets, the better it gets. And I, 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 I've seen that in when it, when it comes to, I think, I think especially personal growth, personal development in business in particular, uh, I, 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 you know, it's, it's evident to me that that's, that that's a truth out there. So, and I think too, like, you know, the universe works in equals, so good has to be offset by not good. Right. But I think you think about what you're saying, you know, as you get moving forward, you got that inertia pushing you, the universe is helping you out. Then you're better able to deal with the things that you might have previously seen as like the end all be all end of my day, yeah. horrible. And now it's more like, eh, okay. So we figure this out. Yeah. And yeah. so it's like being able to weigh those better. Yeah. Well, like you said, when you've got some momentum and you're moving forward, it's like if, if anybody's ever mountain biked uh, or, or, or motorcycled or even driven a car over some rough terrain, like momentum's everything because you come up against bumpy stuff and rocks and, and obstacles. And if you have, you know, enough momentum and speed and force behind you to carry you through that stuff, it's, it's kind of a piece of cake. Right. But if you don't, Holy cow. Is it, can it be like, it can stop you and you're yeah, you not need a rescue vehicle to yeah. get you out of the mud. Bog. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. It can stop you in your track. I'm speaking from experience or anything. <laughs> Doesn't sound like it. <laughs> yeah, no, I sunk straight to the bottom. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we all have. And that's, you know, to me, that's what is amazing about life. And, and I'm, you know, I'm 48 and like, I feel like I've had lived a few lifetimes in, in a short period of time. Uh, because I, I look back on even in, just in real estate and my real estate career at, all the things eight years ago, six years ago that I didn't know that I didn't know. And all the, all the opportunity that was available and is available now and was available then that I just didn't have my head around. Like, I just didn't know that apartments were a thing, right? Like you can do apartments as a, as relatively entry level investor. And like, that's kind of almost odd to some people would sound audacious to say, but it's true. Like, I can, I can like, you know, David Tupin was just on my show. That kid did a freaking apartment building while he was in college in class, didn't know a thing about real estate, didn't have any money, didn't know how he was going to pull that deal off. It was an 18 unit. Like, and like, look, he just went and did it. (laughs) It's, It's the biggest difference between him and so many of us. Right. And, and me at his age is that he went and did it, but he also had to have at some point the, the, his head around this idea that this can be done and I can do it. I don't know how. And he he was the first one to say, I had no idea what I was doing and didn't know how I was going to get this done, but he was audacious enough in his head to say, I can get this done. And he did. It's amazing. Wow. So it, yeah. it really is how you speak to yourself too, though. Cause totally. like if, if I'm wanting to crawl into that hole in the ground, I'm also more likely to kick myself while I'm down there. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, I think that's something maybe not everybody faces, but I think there's a lot of people out there that, you know, you can be your biggest cheerleader one day and then things go a little South 
and you wind up coming down on yourself. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so it makes it harder to crawl out of that hole. Right. Um, and it's, that's when it becomes really important to make sure that you've surrounded yourself with people that will help you get out of that hole. That's right. um, and why it's so important to have a team that is, is more than just the transaction. So true. Well said. That's really well said. So let, let's shift gears for a sec. So tell me about what, like, what else you, you guys have cooking at this point. I, I, I know that this is probably all consuming, this is like all consuming. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and whatnot, but you know, as you, if you can pick your head up for just a second and kind of look out over the horizon, um, you know, what do you, let's maybe talk about like the, the next say two, three years, like what, what are you and Jason uh, creating? Where, where do you want to see this go? So Jason is actually transitioning from W2 to 1099. Um, so he'll be moving into a consulting role with his company, okay. which, um, which just gives a lot more flexibility. Yeah. And so we intend to take down some more deals. Um, I don't know how many, because I'm, I'm not going to like put a number out there Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. because I, I just don't know. I know that about a month ago we were sitting at the brewery here and I talked to everybody because that's what I do and wound up sitting across from this realtor who's like, well, Hey, I know a lady that has a, you know, X, Y, Z number of unit complex and she's not taking such great care of it. It'd be off market. You think you'd be interested? And we were like, yeah, that rule of the first deal. Right. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And, and the reason why that conversation happened is because you're already doing a deal, mm-hmm. right? It's like, it, it, this thing is magical the way that that happens. Um, and yeah, heck yeah, that's, that could be a great opportunity. Well, and because we had a deal, we were able to talk intelligently about the process. Yep. And so he was way more open and sharing that he had an inside connection to someone mm. that it'd be an off market deal. Yeah. That's so cool. Good for you. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So that's cool. So, I mean, you guys want to keep doing deals. Do you, I mean, do you have any particular types of deals that you like scale asset class area? Um, depending on how this one goes, all, all of our single families are local except for one. And I like being able to drive by them <laughs> and check them out and yeah. make sure everything's going the way it should be going. So if it, if it makes sense for us to continue investing here in our backyard, that will be what we do. Cool. Um, if it stops making sense, we'll go other places. I mean, we're an hour and a half, two hours from DFW. We're two hours from Oklahoma city. I mean, we've got options. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I know somebody that, that uh, does a lot in Oklahoma city. So (laughs) there's potential there too. So Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, North Texas is a great place for, for this, for this business, for what we're doing and then investing in multifamily, cash flowing assets is DFW is unbelievable. It's uh-huh. there's it's nothing, crazy. there's nothing like Dallas Fort Worth in this country. And people don't even realize that like, it's pretty much like the fourth or fifth mega city in the country, if not the third, or even like, um, I don't know. I just yeah. know that what's going on there is wild and crazy. It's yeah. just on fire. Yeah. So, um, but the tertiary markets around there are going to all be really good places to do this as well. And, you know, investing where you are and what, in in what, you know, is so smart. Um, we can't do that here in Utah. We we've, we've tried the Utah game pretty hard, but it is so expensive here. And we, we require our properties to have positive cash flow, yeah. And it's really hard to do that at the price points that we're where we are here in Utah. But uh, so that's, you know, we love Oklahoma City and we love Columbus, Ohio. Those are our two nice. markets, as you know. But um, so what's been the biggest surprise for you uh, in this whole process of doing this first deal? I don't know. There's been so many. <laughs> OK, well, just yeah, give us a few then. <laughs> um, just because you schedule someone to come out during due diligence doesn't mean they're going to show up. Mm, yeah. So like, like inspectors, contractors. 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so like you have to have more than one or two so mm-hmm. that when the first one doesn't show up, you move on to the second or the third or however many you have to go down. Yeah. Um, Cause you've got to do the plumbing stuff. You've got to do, if there's a pool on site, you, you want to do the pool. Um, you want someone that can look at the roof. You want somebody that can look at the foundation. And if any number of those people don't show up, you need to have more than one. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so it was just like being on top of that and like continuing to follow up. Hey, are you still coming at two? Hey, are you still coming at three? Are you going to be here on Wednesday? Are you coming on Friday? Mm-hmm. Um, because there are people that are like, yeah, I'll be there. I'll be there. I'll be there. And they just ghost. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Man, that get contractors right now is that's a, that's a tough, that's a tough one. It's a tough part of this business is finding good contractors, good workers, good inspectors. Well, that was, that was the, I guess that was surprising to me because if you say you're going to be somewhere. Oh no. Show yeah. Up? yeah. <laughs> no. I know it's unbelievable. It really is like the way that people can, can function that way in business and, and still be alive and kicking is amazing to me. But unfortunately it's, it's almost a little bit um, kind of like the norm in our space to a certain degree, Um, not ghosting necessarily, but just, just not, unfortunately there's so much demand for contractors and builders and developers and, you know, the subcontractors and it's tough, especially when you're doing smaller projects and you're relying on smaller operators uh, in the contractor space, it can be very, very challenging. I feel you on that one. And I guess the other big surprise has been when I'm trying to raise capital and people are so reluctant to say no. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And I'm like, no, just let me put you in the no bucket. (laughs) So I can go ahead and move on. It doesn't change our relationship. Sure. I'm not going to be mad at you because it's not a good time for you, but just if you can't do it, say no, don't think you're going to hurt my feelings. Yeah. And so that's been a little bit surprising to me because it makes it hard as you're, as you're trying to go through your contacts and you've got people that are still sitting in the maybe section. Mm -hmm. And so you're still having to continue to, you know, circle back to them, follow up with them. And whereas if people would be less afraid of hurting your feelings and they just said, you know, I really can't do it. You could just put them in the no bucket and keep going. Yeah. So yeah. That's, yeah, people, that's been very surprising to me. Yeah. I think the psychology there is people just don't want to disappoint you and they, they care about you and they want you to be successful and they're embarrassed to, to have to say no, maybe. Right. Like uh, maybe. Um, I, I don't know either, but, um, it, yeah, capital, the capital raising thing is, uh, you know, it's, it, there's, again, there's a reason why this is a team sport. I mean, it is totally different than going out and finding a deal, putting a deal under contract, doing due diligence, getting a deal to closing, et cetera. The capital raising aspect of this, of this business is marketing. It's uh, presentation, it's uh, networking, and that's a whole different skill set and a whole different activity set than somebody that's out finding deals and putting bringing deals down. So again, team sport, team sport, team sport, like, yeah. and figure out what your superpower is and what you do well in this space and do that, like bring that to the team and do that stuff. Like you've got your, is it, is Jason one of the spreadsheet guys? Jason is the spreadsheet. Is the spreadsheet. I mean, that's key, right? Like that's his superpower. That's yeah, Jason's like he, superpower. He, he literally like coded all of his own macros. Yeah, there you go. That's, <laughs> that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Um, and, and, you know, so that's his superpower and that's what he can bring to your team. And he knows that. And, and that's what makes him valuable. And then there's, there's other people probably working the broker relationships and the, and working that into things. And, Um, so I think knowing what it is that you do well and knowing yourself is so, so important. Yeah. And I think too, just to understand that just because some teams have very common roles, doesn't mean every team's going to have common roles. So like Jason is the underwriter. And so like 
K. Trevor is, he's really good at the asset management piece of things. And then Bruce is really good at going through the documents and Carrie's really good at making sure that we're hitting everything we need to hit in a meeting and that we're carrying out our objectives. Mm -hmm. And then where do I fit in? Well, I'm kind of like, so I heard the most common, the most awesome um, title the other day from Chase. They, they have a person that is called the relationships manager. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh, that is my new title. Mm -hmm. And so it's, but it's kind of like this floating role because I talked to the property management team. I've got the relation. I've got really good relationships with people that are on our property management company there. And that's asset management right there is kind of what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm kind of a go between there on the asset management piece because I can get them on the phone and I can get them in a text message where other people may not be able to. Mm -hmm. And then like, when it comes to like, just invest the investor piece of it. I can talk to people in a text and they'll respond to me or I can call or I, it's just that that's the, you know, the investor side of it, the investor relations piece of it, the capital raising piece of it, but it's the relationships go everywhere. And that's what I'm good at is the relationship piece. So it, it puts me in a situation where I'm, I'm literally like a go between. So if someone's at an event and they're showing me pictures of people that are there, I'll start texting those people and be like, Hey, are you at such and such event? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, you know, I would love to have Trevor come over and talk to you about that deal. Mm. Do you know who he is? And so then he's not coming into a conversation cold. Mm. He's he's coming into a conversation that's already been prompted with some text messages. That's cool. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. So it worked out really well. (laughs) Well, I think that's something we'll probably keep doing. (laughs) That's awesome. I love that idea. And I, I love the relationships manager role. Uh, because this is a 100% a relationships game, whether it's your tenants that you have your relationships with, your property manager, your lender, your investor, your maintenance guys, you, you know, your leasing agents, your, uh, you have to have top-notch relationships with all of those people, your, your legal team. Um, I mean, it's kind of, it's your, your broker, your lender broker, like all that stuff. Um, and so that's having somebody that's really got their eyes on the quality and, and content of the relationships that everybody on the team has is that's, I, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, I, I think that's really valuable. Okay. So words of wisdom, the kind of parting to words of wisdom, what would you say to, uh, you know, somebody that's where you were, let's say a year ago, you know, before, this deal was under contract before you had this deal and you were doing all the things with your real estate investing rocks and your events and whatnot. Like what'd you go back and tell yourself a year, a year later? The mistakes don't matter. Mm, Um, I mean, they, they do, but they don't because you learn from them. Right. Yeah. So don't be so afraid of making a mistake that you don't do what you're wanting to do. Because once you're done with it, those mistakes really don't matter as much as you think they did. I love it. I really love it. It's kind of like fail forward a little bit. If, if you're failing forward, then they're not really mistakes, right? Cause you're using them as stepping stones to move forward, but uh, mistakes don't matter. I love that. I love it. That's so great. Um, so, okay. Awesome. Let me just geek out for a second. Any great books that you've been into recently, audio books, um, anything been inspiring you, lighten you up? Um, probably the best one that I've read recently was super coach. Oh, wow. Um, and that was one of Julie Holly's in her book club. She okay. had us read super coach. It was really good. And probably after that would have been soundtracks, which is basically like what, what thoughts are on that loop in your head? Wow. Um, and I think that's why as humans, when things start going in a direction we're not familiar with, we go back to what we know. Even if what we know was bad, we go back to that because that's where our comfort lies. So when things start getting stressful, do you read more? Do you watch more TV? Do you drink more every evening? You know, mm-hmm. what are you doing that is your familiar zone? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it talks about that some in the soundtracks of, you know, what is that loop of thought that Mm -hmm. comes back to you um, without thinking about it? Like when things go bad, what loop is playing in your head? 
yeah, when that, things go great, what loop is playing in your just, head? Yeah, that programming and that, mm-hmm. yeah, that narrative. That's, I, I love it. That's so good. Um, what's the gist of Super Coach? Uh, it's a lot of, a lot of the same, like as far as like what's going on internally. And it talks about how you really can't, I mean, people do all the time. They do those outside in kind of transformations. They go on extreme diets or they go on extreme workout programs or, you know, they can do those outside ends, but the things that really stick are the things that you create from the inside out. Okay. Gotcha. So so the things that are really meaningful on a soul level are the things that you are way more likely to stick with because willpower, willpower is not 100%. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So and those yeah. are, I think that's more of like those outside in programs are all about willpower. Whereas when your yeah. willpower fails, what are you going to rely on? Yeah. Yeah. It's more like, who do you need to become right for that mm-hmm. real, that desired transformation to take place? Not how am I going to force this result? It's more like, who do I need to, who do I need to transform into? Right. Mm-hmm. Like that's where real change comes from. Yeah. Jason on our mirror, he taped, um, what would the me I want to become do? Mm, wow. Love it. Wow. He, Jason, that, Jason's pretty smart guy. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Uh, so, and then what's real estate investing rocks up to right now? Um, you guys have anything coming up? Our next summit is March 24th, 25th, 26th, I think. And cool. I'm going to try and like look at doing things and taking care of the marketing and all that, you know, earlier than two weeks before the event. Um, but we were in the middle of a deal, so I don't feel horrible, horrible about it, but, <laughs> um, cause it was just crazy that it even got pulled off, but, um, we've yeah, just well, been, we're year. trying to get our community going on our website and really just stressing that we want to be a part of people's journeys mm-hmm. because I think everybody needs that companion that's been there that when you want to dig a hole and crawl in it, they're like, ah. Eh, been there. You want to use my old hole and I'll pull you out here in a little bit. (laughs) So we just sharing, sharing experiences because, um, there's been a few people that I've been able to vent to that have been in this business for a long time. Hmm. And the most beautiful part of all of that is when I ask, is this abnormal? And they're like, no, people just don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so it, it makes me look back on things be like, why don't we share everything. Why don't we share when, when things are going crappy with your property management company, or Mm. why don't we share when the underwriting didn't pan pan out? Or why don't we share when this happens or that happens, or this broker relationship blew up or this team blew up? I mean, why don't we share those things? Mm -hmm. Because then when it happens to you and it's going to happen to you, you feel 100% alone because nobody else has ever spoken up about the fact that these things happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be real, right? Like be authentic. Like we're all in the same boat, essentially, you know, at the end of the day, we, we really are, we've got a common humanity and, and as entrepreneurs in the space, there's a commonality to what we're all trying to do. I think that's one of the reasons why there's such a culture of people helping each other out in this space is we, we all want to see each other do well and succeed. And, uh, there's really not a scarcity mentality in this space. And, And if there are, if somebody has that, they're generally not going to end up doing very well. And so, um, I, I, one of the things I love about it is, is the high level folks that I get to hang out with every day, you know, like you, Angel Williams, whatever. (laughs) (laughs) So this has been great. Thank you so much for, uh, for gracing uh, the apartment guys nation with your presence and, and sharing, uh, what you've shared. I mean, we, we all get to we all got a really authentic look into what it takes to do a first deal and, and the things about it that are hard uh, and the things about it that make you sweat. And uh, you know, hopefully we're not over. We're not done. (laughs) No. And, and, you know, we didn't talk a whole lot about like the outcomes of this deal and how great it's going to be and how it's going to like change lives. Right but that's real too. So that's a real thing. Um, But realizing that you're not just buying houses that are stuck together. You're buying, yes, the residences, but you're buying the business of having those residences too. Yes. And so like 
I think that was the first thing that really happened for me when we got into this deal. I was like, wait a second, because there was so much more to it than just like with a single family home. Like the last time we got the portfolio we got, we literally handed the keys to our property manager. One of those houses I've never even been in. Yeah, that's so cool. But that's not how it works for this because it's not just a single family. It's, you know, 72 families. And yeah, the yeah. business of caring for them, making sure their needs are met and making sure that their houses are maintained and taken care of. Yeah. So there's just so many more moving parts. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the case. And, you, and like you said, there's a responsibility level for those 72 families now, like you guys are going to be on the hook for their well being and their, or at least the quality of their housing. Right. Yeah. And um, that's a big responsibility that we don't take lightly. And I know you, you guys won't either. So your heart's in the right place. So, well, listeners, thanks again for listening to the end of another one of these episodes. I, I, I said it last couple episodes, like if you're really, if you're at the end of one of these and you've really engaged and maybe taken some notes and learn what you can from it that speaks volumes about you. It bodes well, so well for you. Um, and you're, you're already well, well, well on your way. So feel good about that today and just know that you're doing the right things and keep doing the right things. Cause this things happen and angel and I are proof of that. And, uh, and I'm, I'm just really excited for you, angel and for, for all of us and, uh, all of us getting busy in this business. Yeah. We all been doing amazing things too. So yeah, Yeah. y'all are killing it, (laughs) killing it, killing it. All right, guys. Well, until next week, you all go out and crush it and we'll see you in a week or so. Take care, everybody. Thanks for listening to the apartment guys with Tate Seymour. Tate and friends are grateful to have you as a loyal listener. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe, rate, review, and share with friends on your Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or any other podcast platform. Also, check out Tate's YouTube channel for videos of many of these episodes and more. Until next time, take massive action steps and rock on.